All right, so um, now I'd like to talk about a very fundamental distinction between two different types of software processes. These are on the one hand the plan-driven processes and on the other hand the agile processes. For the plan-driven ones, it's of course kind of obvious that we have a plan um, and that plan is uh, made in advance at the beginning of the pro uh, project. So all the, um, the activities and each individual step ideally um, is, is determined in advance and then this plan is followed and how much uh, progress the project has made is, can be measured against that plan obviously. Um, on the other hand, um, because this is obviously kind of inflexible, on the other hand we have the agile processes where we don't have a master plan so to say. Uh, we do incremental planning from step to step uh, then, of course, it's easier to, to react to changing uh, conditions to, to different environments and so on. On the other hand, it's more difficult to figure out how far the project has already progressed. And um, this is not a binary decision. It's not either plan-driven or it's agile. There's, this is a spectrum and there's lots of, of hybrid methods that are uh, use some elements from the plan-driven approach and some elements from the agile approach. So as I mentioned in the beginning, there's not one size that fits all. There's also not two sizes. So there's lots of different mixtures between these approaches. But the two fundamental ideas is that either we, we make the plan in advance and try to follow that or that we um, plan along as we go and only make incremental uh, steps in the plan. All right, so now I'd like to show you a couple of uh, software processes. One uh, is the, the very widely used and very old waterfall model and a couple of other uh, traditional models that are uh, quite far on the plan-driven side of things and then I'd like to uh, talk a bit about incremental development which goes more toward the agile side of uh, things and also reuse oriented development. So first of all the waterfall model this is probably something a lot of you have already heard of so this is uh, originally from from regular engineering from construction engineering and mechanical engineering um, and so the way this system works is that you start off with a requirement specification then you do the software design then you do the implementation and unit testing then the integration testing and then finally uh, the maintenance and um, so if you do it like this then it's quite obvious that this is very inflexible so every time you uh, are finished with one stage uh, you progress to the next stage and there's no no intention anymore to change anything for example in the requirement specification after that's been completed um, and yeah, for that reason, it's obviously quite quite hard to, to react to any changes that appear later in the process. Um, the original uh, idea behind the waterfall model actually included these sort of loops that we can go back to earlier stages and revisit them. But um, in, in a lot of people's minds, this approach uh, is in, like in the original uh, image that we just have these individual steps li and like a waterfall the, the results of each stage flow down to the next stage and of course water doesn't really travel back up the waterfall so um, there's kind of a, a, a mindset for many people that this is the way it has to be if you actually use the waterfall model but the original idea was that you can also go back to earlier stages, which of course makes it a, a lot more flexible. But uh, in practice, this doesn't happen as much. So um, each of these uh, phases obviously has a very clear, clear end result. So this is a plan-driven process. Um, often you have uh, kind of an end of each stage with a, with a sign-off that everybody involved kind of agrees on one specific set of documents. And so if you need to go back and change something in those documents, then it's obvious that this is actually expensive because then you have to involve a lot of decision-making people once again for a second iteration and so on. 
Um, where one approach where the waterfall model actually makes sense is if you have a uh, if you have very uh, safety critical systems something like uh, like the engine control unit in a car for example um, where it's really important that in everything runs according to specifications and then it's al also not such a good idea to change the specifications uh, on the fly so here it actually makes sense to um, to fix the specifications early on uh, because everybody needs to be able to rely on that and then um, you progress through the rest of the, the stages step by step. So for these kinds of um, safety critical systems maybe you actually need a, a formal mathematical proof to verify the correctness of the system and this is also usually only possible if you have a very clear and unchanging specification which you can can verify uh, your your system against so for these kinds of applications uh, waterfall model actually makes sense but as it's very inflexible and it's kind of inflexible by design even in the the modified uh, version um, it doesn't work as well for for many uh, for many common, for, let's say, interactive prototype projects. There's a lot of other uh, software process models that also kind of are similar to the waterfall model. So, for example, there's the rational unified process. This is based on um, many ideas behind UML and it's also very much focused on a, on a business perspective. So if you look at this example, we actually have iterations here. So there's uh, two elaboration phases, there's four construction phases and two transition phases. So, um, and uh, as you can see, for example, testing happens uh, especially in between those construction phases and at the end of the transition phase and implementation at the beginning of the construction phases and so on. Um, so this already kind of mixes, is a little bit of a mix between um, plan-driven and agile. So it's still mostly a plan-driven process because uh, a lot of the, for example, the business mod modeling is happening at the beginning and the requirements engineering. Um, but we already have a little bit of iteration between those phases. So there's a bit of a possibility to, to, react, uh, to react to change and not everything is fixed at the very beginning already. Um, the spiral model is also quite similar. Here we have um, a focus on, on risk assessment. So uh, there's four sectors. We start with determining the objectives, then we identify risks, then we do the actual development, and then we do planning for the next iteration. And um, every every iteration of the spiral basically adds another, another chunk of functionality. So first we start with, with a concept, then requirements plan, then a very first prototype then the second prototype, then the operational prototype, and then we're finally done. And as you can see, maybe this model actually doesn't focus uh, quite as much on what comes after the release. I already mentioned this, um, that this is something you shouldn't lose, lose sight of, that we also need to spend resources, time and money on the on the maintenance of the software. And this is, for example, something that the spiral model doesn't, uh, doesn't address quite as well. Um, then, um, if you ever uh, work on a project that's been uh, that's been issued by the German government, then you might uh, encounter the Wii model. This is also quite quite uh, inflexible, and it's based on uh, the waterfall also. So this is yeah, well, it's a government uh, approach. So maybe it actually has to be inflexible in a sense. Um, Currently, uh, I think the Wii model XT is being used and here we have uh, the time axis and here we have the level of detail. So we also start off with the requirements analysis, then we have system architecture, 
system design, then the software architecture, the actual software development, then unit test, integration test, uh, system integration, and finally um, the release and, and usage. And as you can see here also, there's no mention, at least in this high-level process model, there's no mention of uh, maintenance, which is again uh, a little bit unfortunate because this is something that people tend to lose sight of, but which is really an important aspect of, of developing and deploying and using software. All right, so these were the kind of traditional models that are mostly on the plan-driven side of things, similar to the, the waterfall model. Um, and on the other hand, we have incremental development. So here now, um, we have once again the time axis and we have the uh, uh, amount of functionality and features. And we have five smaller phases, which are here called communication, planning, modeling, construction, which is the actual development, and deployment. Deployment is also an important part here. And uh, these phases are repeated again and again in rather short um, um, amount of time. So this isn't like the entire project runtime. These five stages together are maybe something around two weeks. And we repeat that in each increment until we are basically happy with the end result. Of course, that means that we can't really predict when the project will actually end. Um, so we have to be um, basically, we have to be able to stop at every point. But this is kind of the idea behind incremental development too. As you can see, actually, which is really nice in this diagram, the, the uh, amount of features and functionality actually decreases a little bit uh, between each stage in, in each iteration, which is kind of obvious because um, there will always be some features that you are uh, uh, planning for in the initial stages that you can't then really implement in the time you have. And so the actual amount of features in the uh, in each it, uh, the, the end result of each iteration will maybe be a little bit less than you started out with at the beginning. And what's also very, very important is that the results of each uh, iteration of especially of the lat latter stages will then influence the next increment because what you learned during those uh, steps will of course um, have an influence on what you can do and want to do in the next iteration. Um, but if you follow this approach then ideally at, at the end of every little two-week cycle you have a, a, a valid increment that actually is already usable in some way and provides a bit of functionality and uh, as long as you want to basically you repeat this cycle until you're you're happy with the end result so this is often also called evolutionary development and it's kind of the the fundamental idea behind most agile processes so we uh, take only a few weeks to develop uh, a prototype and uh, we test and discuss this with the actual customers and we repeat that cycle until everybody's fine with the, uh, with the outcome basically. And especially if you have um, uh, applications that are going to be uh, used by end users that have some sort of graphical user interface, let's call it, let's say it's a mobile app or a website or whatever, then this is an especially uh, valuable way of developing these kinds of, of interactive applications. Um, then one variant of this, which is kind of a hybrid of what I already uh, talked about earlier, this is reuse-oriented development. Um, well, a big focus is that we want to reuse and adapt existing components. I already mentioned that this is uh, a lot easier now thanks to um, open source software. Um, if we don't want to make large modifications, then of course we need to make some uh, compromises regarding the um, requirements. So here it's called requirements modification. We actually need to, to yeah, compromise a bit uh, based on what is available on the, uh, on the market right now. 
Um, of course, we can adapt and uh, reconfigure the existing components up to a certain point, but if we want to uh, be really quick, then maybe we can just can't afford uh, many large modifications and have to, to yeah, uh, scale down our requirements a bit. Um, especially in, in, in a web context, this is uh, very often used because uh, if you're developing a web application, then you're usually not starting by actually building a web server, but you will just use Apache or um, or whatever, Nginx, whatever is out there, and you will also not build a new database. You're usually using Mariah SQL or MySQL or something like that. Um, so you, you won't reinvent the wheel. And this is really something you should be, you should be wary of. Um, but you will use existing components as far as possible and maybe just write a small PHP application that is then sitting on top of all the rest. So um, this is actually something that is being done on a daily basis uh, by a lot of people, um, and which is quite an important thing to keep in mind that it's not necessary to build everything from scratch. All right, so one other important aspect I'd like to talk about is how to deal with change. So during your software development process, things will inevitably change, um, except in very, very specific circumstances, like for example, when you're developing um, a very safety critical system, then a lot of specifications will be fixed in advance and it's uh, very unlikely that things will change, but in any regular project, you will have changing new circumstances. And there's two ways to, to deal with this. One is called um, change avoidance that is then uh, done using so-called prototyping. And the other, other aspect is called change tolerance, which is then incremental delivery. So let's look into each of these um, approaches in turn. Prototyping means that we um, really quickly iterate over prototypes and uh, put them out to users. Um, this is always helpful during all the phases of software development, during the specification phase, during the uh, development phase. And the, uh, the very early prototypes might not even contain any sort of code. So, um, if you're studying HCI, then you might actually have heard already of the concept of paper prototypes. That means that you actually take just a plain sheet of paper and a pen and make a sketch of how the user interface would look like. And then you put that in front of a prospective user and ask them to, to act as if it was actually a proper user interface where you can click buttons. And when they click a specific button, then you just give them an, uh, the next sheet of paper with, uh, with another screen uh, of your sketched user interface. And this already helps you, for example, to figure out uh, flaws in the, in the logical flow of the program, for example. So you never need to write a single line of code for that. Um, you just need a pen and a paper, a couple of sheets of paper and five minutes of time. And then you can already do um, a first mock-up of your user interface. You can also have functional mock-ups. So you can, for example, create something that looks and acts very much like a functional user interface in, in PowerPoint or in HTML. Um, if you have a very complex requirements for the backend of your system. So for example, if there's something like uh, an image recognition part, then you can also use a technique that's called Wizard of Oz. And if you know the fairy tale, then the, the, whole, uh, the whole point behind uh, the, the story of the Wizard of Oz is that there isn't actually a great powerful wizard, but there's a little guy behind the curtain pulling strings and making things happen. And this is actually the whole idea also behind those prototypes. So if you have a very complex image recognition task in your software, maybe, then for a prototype, you don't actually need to implement the whole image recognition, but you can just 
uh, sit somebody uh, in front of another computer in the next room and have them execute the image recognition. So click on the relevant parts of the image. So let just have a human do it. Um, and for the user, it will look like the computer is actually doing the task, even if you haven't implemented that yet. So there's quite a lot of ways to um, create prototypes that uh, help you already get feedback on your software from end users without having to build the whole thing from scratch. And what's also important is that you should always be prepared to um, throw a prototype away and create a completely new one based on what you learn. For the paper prototypes, it's kind of obvious. You, you throw them in the bin after you're done with them in any case. Um, but you should, of course, write down what you learned. And um, even for the functional prototypes, you should also always be prepared to, um, to do away with at least one iteration and start from scratch. Um, because uh, it's often easier to actually build a next level prototype once again uh, from the beginning uh, and not attempt to, to like change an existing prototype so that it fits with what you learned. So sometimes this can actually be more difficult than just starting again uh, anew. All right. And the other approach would be a, a called incremental delivery. This means that um, at the very beginning, you uh, try to make a list of the most important bits of functionality and order them by what's the most important things. And then you try to build something. Um, this is some, sometimes also called a minimum viable product, MYP, um, to deliver these MYPs to the end user um, uh, every two weeks, for example. And of course, put in the most important functionality first. In fact, this can be both used for plan-driven uh, processes and for agile processes. So for a plan-driven process, you would define all the increments in advance that you uh, that you want to deliver. And then in the two weeks cycle, you develop the increment, you validate it, integrate it with the rest, and then uh, hand out the current state of the system to the user, and then you continue with the next increment. And for a, yeah, for a planned version process, you could actually define all of these increments in advance and then just work through the list, basically. Um, when you have an agile process, then you would rather, of course, uh, after, after having delivered one increment with uh, the currently most important feature, then you would probably sit down with the customer and start to discuss what the next increment should look like and what the next most important feature is that you would then um, develop over the following two weeks, for example. All right, so these were a couple of, of strategies of uh, dealing with change in software processes, which will happen in any case. And it doesn't actually matter if you have a plan driven process or an agile process, you will have to deal with change usually. And um, you should be prepared to, to um, integrate that into, into your considerations. Usually for agile processes, it's a bit easier to deal with change, of course, and we'll talk in, a bit in more detail about which agile processes there are and how they in, um, how they make it easier to deal with change in the um, next iteration. All right, so yeah, that's it for this week. So thanks for listening and see you back soon.